My name's Hilary and along with my colleague Ellie here, I work on the My Wild City project in Manchester, uh, as is a project which is helping to improve nature in Manchester and also to help the people in Manchester take notice of their local nature. We're actually lucky enough to have a, a slice or a, a sliver of um, a remnant bog at Moston Fairways Nature Reserve in Manchester actually. Um, so if you'd like to know where that is, you can, you can ask us. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome three of my colleagues at the Wildlife Trust tonight, uh, all of them working for the Lancashire Peatlands Initiative. Uh, we've got Sarah Johnson, Jamie Lawson and Andrew Hankinson, who are all experts on bogs and they'll be talking about different aspects of looking after our local lowland peat bogs tonight. Just a few housekeeping points before we start. Um, your cameras and your microphones will be off through the entire event, so don't worry if you suddenly have to talk to somebody, we won't hear you. And um, just also to let you know that the session will be recorded. Uh, so if you suddenly have to dash off halfway through, uh, you'll be able to um, get hold of it later online. We'll make it available online, won't we, Ellie? Yes. Yeah. So if you can use the chat function, as I said, to let us know where you're dialing in from, that'd be great. Um, but if you've got specific questions uh, as the team is speaking, if you could put those in the Q&A box, otherwise there's a danger that we might miss them. So pop your specific questions in Q&A and there'll be 10 minutes or so at the end of the talk for us to go through those questions and, and ask the, the team to, to answer them. Um, we're aiming to finish at seven o'clock um, and I think that's it for introductions. Uh, over to you Ellie. Great, yes, to kick things off um, we have a little poll for you um, which should be up now actually, hopefully you can you can see that. I see people have already started to vote so we are asking um, do you use peat-free compost? That's not a, tr not a trick question. We're not, we're not gonna pick you out <laughs> if, you, if you don't, um, or if you just don't know, maybe, maybe you don't know. Um, maybe you struggle to, to get hold of it. Um, we know a lot of people uh, can find a bit of difficulty in finding peat-free compost. Maybe you don't know anything about it, and hopefully by the end of um, today's talk, uh, you will be on that peat-free uh, movement with us. Don't worry Marge, Marge says she's answered it wrong and that she always uses peat-free. <laughs> Great, oh. great to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, sli a slip of the mouse button. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'll give you a little bit more time, um, though I can see that most of you have voted now. And that uh, fantastic to hear that 65% of you say that yes, you do use peat-free compost. That's fantastic. Uh, so 90% say that you don't, and 16% say that you usually do. I suppose that you, tr you try your best and you find it where when you can. So fantastic, that's great. I will end. I will end the poll there uh, and I will hand over now to the Peatlands team to tell us all about them. Great, I will just share my screen. Great, so I hope that everyone can hear me okay and I'll get started. So hi everyone, um, I'm Sarah, I project manage the Lancashire Peatland Initiative for Lancashire Wildlife Trust and the team is made up of myself and uh, my brilliant project officers, including Andy and Jamie. And we work alongside many other fantastic staff and volunteers within LWT. And the project is driving forward a coordinated approach to all our peatland habitats, working to improve and restore them, to raise awareness of their importance through campaigning and engaging communities. And we really want to build in resilience for their future protection. And we're flying the flag for all of Lancashire's peatlands. 
We're now going to explain why we think bogs are fantastic and what we can all do to protect them. And we'll give you some highlights of the work that we've been delivering on our lowland peatlands with vital support of volunteers and members. But first, um, so uh, some of you might want to know what exactly is a bog anyway? Well, bogs or uh, peatlands are a type of wetland made up of soil formed from slowly decomposing plants. And healthy peatlands are wet and boggy, almost entirely rainwater fed, and they are, are acidic, low in nutrients and oxygen. So that means that the plant matter can't decay properly. So each year new plants grow and die, and layers of plant material gradually accumulate over hundreds and thousands of years to form peat. And peat bogs support highly specialised communities of plants and wildlife that are perfectly adapted to this hostile environment. And they're a vital part of our heritage. And so um, I would say that working to protect a peat bog doesn't sound as glamorous as say working to, in a tropical rainforest, but we think our peatlands are just as amazing. They're our mini rainforests in terms of the unique habitat and as home to rare and remarkable plants and animals, and for the role they play in protecting our climate, which is something I'll come to in a minute. So on the surface, they might just look like a wilderness area with little to see, but if you take a closer look, they're home to specialised communities of beautiful and beneficial plants. They're amazing places to visit all year round, but I think there's no better place in late spring and summer. We see a vibrant mix of colours. You see the swathes of the white flowers of the common cotton grasses, which are one of the keystone species of our peatlands. You might see the cross-leaf heath, which is part of the heather family and has this lovely pink flower. And of course, then there's the round leaf sundew. It's beautiful and delicate and yet deadly to insects. Sundews are a group of carnivorous plants that produce sticky, sweet smelling fluid from little hairs in their leaves. And these trap and digest insects in their leaves to supplement their diet. So, of course, on healthy peat bogs, you should also see a colourful patchwork of sphagnum mosses, which are these ones here on the top left. Now, sphagnum mosses are probably the most important plant in the bog, and it's known as the building block of peat. So over time, layers of moss form, and when it dies and decays, it de decomposes into peat. And now Andy is going to show us some pretty cool slides of what it looks like close up and explain why it's so special. Evening everyone, um, my name's Andy, as Sarah's just introduced me as. Um, I also work on the peatlands, and I thought if we're going to talk about sphagnum moss, we probably should look at it in a, in a little bit more detail. As Sarah points out, it's, it's the building block of our peatlands a real keystone floral species. We often talk about it, we don't talk about it maybe in the detail that it kind of needs. We talk about how it can retain tons of water, 20 times its, uh, its own weight in water is what we tend to say. Now that can be variable, it's going to be varied on the particular species, and that's going to be impacted by its build up, its makeup. Now what we have in front of us here is a handily uh, labelled sphagnum papillosum cell. Now sphagnum papillosum is a species of Sphagnum. And this is one zoomed image, it's microscope image, of about 40,000 times magnification of one cell leaf. Now, what you see is you'll see chlor, I can't say this word by the way, it's cells that contain chloroplasts essentially. So the ones in green are the ones that undertake the photosynthesis. And the ones in the middle, these kind of clear cells, you know, just pointing left and right in that bottom corner, the hyaline cells. Now it's those cells that retain the water. Now, strangely enough, those cells are actually dead. They aren't actually living at all. And all they do is just retain water like a reservoir. And the difference between different species and their ability to retain water comes from these particular cells. So these ones on this particular slide are quite chunky, but quite small in the same sense, they're quite stocky. If we go to the next slide, Sarah, we can see something very different. We can see sphagnum capillifolium. You see, they're much more elongated. And so the ability to retain water is slightly different. Equally with this picture, I thought it was quite interesting to show this image because sphagnum capillifolium tends to have a kind of reddish tinge to it. Variable, of course, but generally speaking, it'll be a reddish kind of ruby color. And that you can see within these, uh, these chlorophyll uh, cells again, even though you can still make out the green little chlorophyll cells themselves, the actual areas around them are still red. They've got a red kind of pigment to them. Just to put it into a bit of perspective, I thought I'll put this other image up in that bottom left corner. That's what we're actually looking at under magnification. And it's one cell thick. So we take one particular leaf off a branch of, uh, of sphagnum 
and put it under a microscope and it's one cell thick, which blows my mind to be perfectly honest that something so thin and so dainty and so delicate can actually retain so much water and be so robust within its habitat. Um, next slide please. So, this is actually a quick video that I thought I'd show because we think about plants, we see plants on a day to day and we see sphagnum on a day to day. But when you get under the microscope, you suddenly start to realise that there's actually life within each individual leaf and then each individual cell. Now this little critter is, is a type of rotifer. What type of species, I'll never know. There's like 20,000 species, I've not got a clue. But it's just incredible to think that under that tiny, tiny, that tiny, tiny leaf, there's yet more life. So I just thought I'd show it to you because it's not something that I see very often. Some little tiny organism just going up and down the side of a sphagnum cell leaf, quite happily getting on with its life. A whole world that we didn't even realize or know about until you get it under this kind of uh, magnification. And I think we've got, we've got a final slide, Sarah. I don't know. Uh, let's have a look. I think that might be it. Yeah, oh, that was it. That was just a little quick, a little, uh, a little intro into a bit of sphagnum. I thought it was going to a little bit more detail. Thanks, Andy. That's amazing. Those, those pictures are absolutely mind blowing, as you say, and beautiful as well. You're so, right, yeah. yeah. So, as we said, you know, um, healthy big bugs, you know, are home to amazing plants, but also home to um, other wildlife as well. So, many insects make their home in the bog. Uh, for example, a large number of butterflies and moths are attracted by the wide variety of plants you can find in healthy peat bogs, and damselflies and dragonflies are often seen flying about in our moslins. And one of the real treats in summer is hearing the rare bog brush cricket, which you can see in the bottom middle here, calling amongst the heather. You also, I think we've had more than a hundred species of birds recorded in chat moss in Greater Manchester, and there you might, for example, see swoop, swoop of swifts flying over the water bodies, hawking for insect prey. And the mosses are also fantastic places, for example, to see brown hair and also um, common lizards as well. You can see there, you might see them along the fence line basking on an early summer's day. But okay, so peatlands provide a, a vital habitat for specialised plants and animals, but why else do we need bulls? What do they do for us? Well, when it comes to climate change, peatlands are vital. Undamaged peat bogs store and absorb vast amounts of carbon from the atmosphere, locking it away in their peaty soils for millennia. The UK's peatlands store billions of tonnes of carbon, and globally, peatlands store twice as much carbon as all the world's forests. Whereas damaged peatlands actually leak carbon into the air, becoming a source of carbon emissions. Peat bogs can also help to reduce flooding. Healthy peatlands act like sponges, soaking up water during periods of high rainfall and then gradually releasing it over time, so slowing the flow. And they can also improve water quality by acting as natural water filtration systems. And bogs are also really valuable to help historians learn about the past. As bogs are high in acidity, they can preserve things for thousands of years, and many items have been found in bogs still intact, even bodies. And we've, uh, we've not found a body in our work yet, but we do have um, bog oaks, thousands of years old bog oaks, which we found on some of our reserves, which are amazing to see. And of course, healthy wet peatlands are also much more resilient to wildfires, which for some of you, you know, uh, who um, live around the Greater Manchester area, you will have heard of the, the wildfires that we've had around the uplands, around Greater Manchester and beyond. And, you know, when they're healthy, wet, intact peatlands, they're much more resilient to this kind of, this kind of thing that's happening. But, and there is a big but. This picture in the background is of Little Walden Moss, which is only about 30 miles from Manchester city centre. And it's a site which we're now in the process of restoring. Now, the first time I saw Little Walden Moss, it was a blackened, barren moonscape. I can't describe it any other way. It was dried out and totally stripped of wildlife, drained and releasing vast amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. It was being commercially extracted for peat compost. Now the fact is, we live in one of the most nature depleted countries on the planet and sadly peatlands are very rare, only a fraction remains. 80% of peatlands in England are damaged or degraded and just 2% of our lowland peat bogs remain in our region and still face threats. The majority of our lowland peatlands have been exploited and drained for agriculture, development and horticulture. And they can't provide the vital functions I mentioned if they're drained, destroyed or degraded. The UK's damaged peatlands are emitting millions of tonnes of carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere every year and a wealth of wildlife has disappeared along with them. Now we have to say this vital habitat it isn't easily replaced 
Pink bogs grow at a rate of just one millimetre a year. So it takes a thousand years for one metre of peat to develop. So it can't just be recreated. So that's why protecting and fixing them is crucial, not just for wildlife, but for us as well. Well, Lancashire Wildlife Trust is working hard to improve and restore our precious peatlands. And this is what Little Warden Miss Moss looks like today, less than 10 years from the start of restoration. It still has a long way to go, but we're already seeing plants like sphagnum mosses and the cotton grasses returning and other wildlife along with them. And I'm now going to hand over to Andy uh, to talk about how we're doing this and highlight some of the exciting work that we're doing. Thank you very much, Sarah. So yeah, as Sarah's been pointing out, we've uh, been working hard over almost 10 years now. We've got a little warden in 2013. So a lot of restoration has gone into the site so far. First things that we look to do in a site like this is to restore the hydrology of the site. Since what will have happened in a degraded peatland is the likelihood is it's been drained. Hence, once you lose that water, you're going to lose those uh, bog species, those floral species that would normally exist there because they can't survive in these much drier conditions. So the way we go about doing that is we look at the topography of the site because we want to work with the water as opposed to work against it because as we all know, water is pretty much an unstoppable force. Uh, so you look at where the water naturally wants to flow and the best way is it kind of retaining it. Because the important thing to remember is it's got to be rain fed. It's an ombrotrophic habitat, which means it's only fed by rainwater. No other water source is going to be getting to the site and, and uh, adding to it in any way. So we do this through a, a number of bunding networks. Bunds are just simply raised areas of peat. Uh, we dig that out and repack it. So it holds the water in individual cells. And it will slowly build up over time when we get a, a lot of rain or not so much rain and it will rehydrate the peat. Now this can vary in the amount of time it takes because it's going to vary on uh, the quality of the peat and the peat depth, for example. So that's the first stage in what we're looking to do. Once you start to get rainwater staying on site again, you're then in fighting champs because then you can start bringing back some of those floral bog species. So a lot of what we've been doing more recently, because the site is in a much better condition, is planting thousands of these uh, bog species. Part of the reason we're planting so many is one, we are in somewhat a bit of a race against time because as Sarah's pointed out, bare peat emits carbon. So you want to try and get it vegetated as quickly as possible. The other point we need to remember is that these species likely are not likely to, to make it there naturally through a wind dispersal, for example, because the areas are so fragmented and so rare. You think Little Water Moss is, is cut up with the M6 going on one side, the Lanx, uh, East Lanx in the north and the M62 in the south, but a railway line going a bit further north as well, and it's splitting up all these different areas. So if we can give it a little general push, that's what we're looking to do. And it's these kind of floral species that start to allow us to bring back that key species of sphagnum moss. Sphagnum moss is, I say, very delicate, very susceptible to uh, desiccation from the wind, so it can dry out very easily. And of course, it can easily dry out from the sun as well. So you have these floral species like the one in the image back in, uh, on this uh, presentation. You see lots of hare's tail cotton grass and some common cotton grass. It provides protection for the sphagnum moss. Once it's got that protection, it's going to stay in situ when it starts soaking up water and start acidifying uh, the habitat even further. Um, so what we do in relation to that is once we've got sphagnum growing in abundance, again, like the one in the image, we can then take that from that area responsibly, looking around maybe 10% uh, within a particular area, and move it somewhere else suitable. Again, just kick-starting that restoration process once more. Obviously, part of the restoration process, we need to be aware of things like invasives, uh, particularly things like Japanese knotweed, which can be horrendously invasive. You know, once it's in a site, it's in. Um, we certainly want to prevent that from getting in and, and overrunning the site. And equally, rhododendrons can be a major problem. They get everywhere. You must have made it there from um, Victorian times when they had lovely ornamental gardens. Great plant, and it does some decent stuff. But, my God, it can be an absolute pain once it's in. Equally, uh, when a site's been degraded, like Little Walden has been, you tend to get silver birch in quite an abundance. And when that comes in, we have it a bit of an issue because what it will do is, as, as a pioneer species, birches is, is, will grow pretty much anywhere. You'll find it in, in tips, never mind on degraded box, but it will add nutrients back into a habitat, which we want to be nutrient poor, as well as take up water. And of course, that's something else we want an abundance of as well. 
that's going to go to dual approach, which would want to stop from happening uh, and equally stop any succession into a woodland happening at all. It's interesting to note, though, that scrub in the first instances of restoration is an issue. But once you've got a, an active, functioning, healthy bog, trees on site and a hole, especially if you look at European sites, aren't so much of an issue. They'll grow to a certain height and a certain age, but then they'll just give up life. It'll be too hard for them to continue and they'll fall into the bog and form part of the peat in thousands and thousands of years. Those are some of the things that we've been doing uh, to restore some of these sites. A lot of bunding, a lot of planting, and general management in regards to invasive controls and scrub clearance are actually key things, and of course, sphagnum translocations. Talking of species, we have been doing an awful lot of species reintroductions because we want to try and pack in as much diversity into our sites as humanly possible. With diversity comes a robust, strong habitat. So, species reintroductions is part of a Greater Manchester Wetlands uh, project. So, we've been looking at reintroducing floral species as well as fauna as well. Go on to the next slide, Sarah. The most key one that's happened recently, the one that's been, uh, been worked through for a number of years now, is the Manchester Argus butterfly. Now, this was a, well, it is a key bog species, which we have on other sites, which we manage up towards uh, Garstown, for example. There's a lovely population up there, which is expanding its range quite wonderfully across the moss. But it is, well, was noticeably absent from a couple of our uh, SSSI sites, so sites of scientific interest, in Astley Moss, which is in Great Manchester, and also from uh, Risley Moss, which is just in Warrington, who we partnered with in order to uh, start this reintroduction. What we did is um, we partnered with Chester Zoo as well. Uh, Chester Zoo um, bred a number of individuals in captivity. I think the final was around 43. And they took these from the donor site up in Garstang and bred them in captivity for us. You know, it's great having this kind of expertise on hand because uh, it's a pretty tr tricky process to handle and look after um, butterfly caterpillars into chrysalis and then get them to site. Um, equally, it was just great to have them on board because they have a wide range of uh, people who can get involved. We had them on site to do some wonderful videos which really got the word out, which is very exciting. Now, this is the first year, well, last year was the first year this occurred. Uh, it was a successful reintroduction in which we were able to observe uh, territory defending. Uh, uh, we observed um, breeding within individuals as well, which is fantastic, which means there's a positive sign, which they might start to already um, breed on site successfully. Now, obviously, it doesn't mean that we stop reintroducing them at this point. It's going to be an ongoing uh, five-year project minimum, 10 years monitoring as well, in which we keep on bolstering that population until we can prove that there's a sustainable population on site. This is an absolutely key species. Manchester Argus is its colloquial name, so it seemed really suitable to be the first species that we try and reintroduce back in to our mossland habitats. Next slide, please, Sarah. The bog bush cricket has already come up uh, in a, uh, by Sarah already. Um, it's kind of synonymous with bogs, as the, as the name would suggest. Um, not to put a damper on that, it doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean it's a bog specialist. It's, uh, I think it was probably just found on a bog first and therefore named bog bush cricket. You'll find it across its European range in heathlands and in calcareous grassland. So it's quite adaptable. But due to the fact in the UK particularly uh, that it seems to be synonymous with lowland bogs, it can be deemed to be rare. And we are fortunate enough to have it on a couple of our sites, uh, Little Water Moss being one of them, and the adjacent Cadishead Moss. But again, it's noticeably absent from other mossland sites namely Astley Moss, and again, Risley Moss, which somewhat ironically are in a better state than Little Warden and Cadizet. They are, like I say, triple SI sites. So the assumption is, based on logic and a bit of digging in history, is that they probably um, became extinct from those sites or exp exp expatated, extirpated from those sites due to historic burning. Uh, due to it's, uh, Astley and Rizzi were both cut for peat and unfortunately part of that process is burning the, uh, the actual peatland itself, which was not ideal. But since this particular species, although has wings, is actually flightless, it probably wouldn't have been able to escape. Therefore, probably would have been destroyed. So what we've done is we've surveyed some donor sites. So namely again, Little Warden, another sister site uh, from Cheshire Wildlife Trust. Uh, and we found that there's really healthy populations there. 
So we've begun the processes of a reintroduction program. This is going to be a long process though because the, uh, the eggs are biannual. So they'll lay eggs one year, you'll see nothing for the next year, and then the second year is when they'll hatch. So it's going to take a fair old amount of time uh, to get this up to a point where there's uh, uh, self-sustaining populations of this species on these sites. But this year, so 2021 is the first year where we're going to attempt to reintroduce because we collected two years ago now. Here's an interesting image, which I've never seen before. This is from one of our volunteers, Dave Steele, who uh, is a known birder around Berlin. He actually saw this image of a female bogbush cricket ovipositing, so putting her eggs into the ground, which is probably, like I say, a sight that's rarely ever seen, which again, you kind of ties into this whole idea of why bogs are quite an incredible space. There's lots of these very small instances of life occurring all around us, which we sometimes miss. Just thought I'd show us, because like I say, never seen anything like it before. I'm really encouraging them to see this happening as well. Like we know they're there, but to see it actually occurring is fantastic. So what else are we looking at? We're looking at white face data as well. White face data, again, it's synonymous with box um, down in Delamere. There was a reintroduction uh, back at starting in 2013. And now we're in a position in our Mosslands and our Manchester Mosslands where we are looking at this as the next potential reintroduction. Um, not found all over the place, like I say, Delamere and down in Shropshire as well. I think they've got some over at uh, Falshaw Moss as well, I think. Uh, but we are looking at now creating suitable kind of bog pools with lots of cuspidatum in there, sphagnum cuspidatum, which is an aquatic species of sphagnum, which is what it needs. Um, but that's now in the planning phases, and hopefully in the next year or so, we'll have something together where we can get this going. And like I say, the bogbush cricket continues as well. One of the most interesting ones, though, is the plants. Uh, plants uh, have been reintroduced by a guy called Joshua Stiles, who's a, a botanist and ecologist who runs the Northwest Rare Plants Initiative. Very enthusiastic fantastic knowledge and he's been a bit of a one-man band uh, he's working within partnership with LWT and the Great Manchester Wetlands Project but it's him who's driving the plants and he's introduced lesser bladderwort which is a fantastic carnivorous plant species one of the fastest species in the, on the planet I think it moves at one 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 ten thousandth of a second so it's got these underwater kind of bladders and the speed at which they move is one ten thousandth of a second Google it on YouTube, you'll find a really interesting YouTube video. It's not very long, one, one, ten, one, one ten thousandth of a second probably, but it's there, it's there and it's worth watching. Uh, but that was reintroduced and he's had almost 200, the last count in this one says 185,000, I think it's pushed over 200,000 individual plants off a handful. And I mean a handful, we're looking at 30 or so. We're also looking at white peak sedge. Again, it's synonymous with um, bog species and it's all about adding that floral diversity. Uh, we've got that reintroduced on a couple of sites and also sundews, another fantastic carnivorous species. Great, an oblong of sundew are now on one of our sites and are doing really well, which is an indication of how healthy the bog is. If it wasn't suitable and you reintroduce these plant species, they wouldn't thrive, they wouldn't survive, and it'd be an indication of a poor habitat. This is really encouraging news for the restoration efforts. Next slide, please. With Marley Carbon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Andy. That was really interesting, just to get a really nice overview of the kind of work that you, you and your colleagues are doing to restore um, our peatlands, for example, little water moss in, uh, in Salford. Um, so now I'm going to talk about a, a very, quite a different project, but equally exciting. And it's work we're doing to establish a landscale carbon farm on former drained agricultural land. And it's the first project of its kind in the UK. It's part of Care Peat, which is a multinational EU funded initiative, which is investigating new methods of capturing and storing carbon through peatland restoration. So the picture here as of one of our loan and raised bog reserves taken last summer you can see the beautiful swathes of cotton grasses there and if you walk across it you'll see other characteristic bog species such as you know the sphagnum mosses those vital building blocks of peat and protecting and restoring loan and raised bogs as um, Andy has just been describing is only part of the solution to the management of our peatlands. The fact is a vast majority of the rich peat soils in loan areas in the UK have been drained either for grassland production or for agricultural fields and the drainage used for conventional agriculture and peatlands is the root cause of many of the problems associated with that management such as 
loss of wildlife, decrease in water quality and storage and greenhouse gas emissions. Now, of course, rewetting helps to solve most of the problems caused by drainage. And this is what we're doing on the sites that we are restoring, either on land we own or working with partners. However, restoration usually implies a stop or reduction in the agricultural production of peatlands and wholesale rest restoration may not always be possible or desirable for farmers who need to make a living. So what's the solution? Is there another choice for farmers? Well, as part of the Care Peat project, we've set up a carbon farm pilot, which is looking to try and find solutions to that question and looking at alternative climate friendly land management options. Um, it's looking to restore the carbon storage capacity of our peatlands in a way that could also continue to support farm business potentially. So the site, as you can see here, is on a former loan and raised bog, which was converted to agricultural land in the 1970s. And the aim of the project is to rapidly turn the site from a carbon source to a carbon sink through raising the water table and planting a permanent cover crop of sphagnum mosses. And I'm now going to show you a short video about Carbon Farm to explain more. This is Wim Marley Moss Triple SI, and healthy peatlands such as this can store and absorb huge amounts of carbon from the atmosphere, making them a vital natural solution in the fight against climate change. However, when they are drained or damaged in any way, that carbon gets released, contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. to uh, Winmarley Carbon Farm. Uh, this area uh, up until the 1970s was a lowland raised peat bog, then turned into agricultural land. This is sphagnum moss and it's a vital building block of peatlands and it absorbs carbon from the atmosphere. So on this carbon farm we're essentially planting a permanent cover crop of sphagnum moss to absorb and trap carbon in the ground. So the first thing we did was strip the surface, the top layer off, uh, to remove all the nutrients. these tiny plugs of sphagnum will grow and cover the entire area. That will initially stop area from releasing carbon like it is now and then it will turn into that vital carbon store. This collar has been put in by uh, MMU to analyse greenhouse gas uh, emissions from this peat soil and we'll be studying that over the next two years uh, to be able to uh, show the data uh, to uh, stakeholders and farmers so they can adopt these practices hopefully in the future. Visit lankswt.org.uk for more information. So that was just a, a brief overview of the, the Care Peak Carbon Farm. And as um, my colleague Mike there said in the video, we're collecting data, working with Manchester Met University over the next few years too, to analyse the benefit of this kind of land management on peat soils um, and to hopefully demonstrate the benefits to farms and other stakeholders in ways that this can be financially viable. And we're also monitoring the effect of this wetting of this kind of land in buffer zone areas around uh, nature reserves to see how they benefit those as well. And as I mentioned it's the first time it's been done in the UK and it's definitely been a steep learning curve but we're really excited to see it coming to reality. Okay so now um, I'm going to move on uh, to and hand over to Jamie who's going to talk about the work we've been doing with volunteers who are vital to the work that we do and also he's going to talk about what else you can do to help our peatlands. Oh, sorry, wrong way. I just play it again, it's fine. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, over to you, Jamie. Hello, so yeah, now you hopefully love bogs, and now you've heard all the great stuff about them, but what can you do to help the box? <coughs> Volunteers are basically the backbone of the peatlands. If we had tried to restore Little Walden, Without the help of volunteers, we would have worked ourselves into early graves years ago. So yeah, we really appreciate everything we do, everything they do to help us. And there's a lot of different things that 
you can get involved in if we go to the next slide. So that's it. Sorry. So rough overview of the type of stuff we'll do over the year. So that's everything from scrub clearance, bund repair, because water likes to erode the bunds, it doesn't help our job at all. Uh, a lot of planting the last few years, and there's a lot more planting to do. Uh, sometimes it sounds a bit fancy and we call it translocation, which is basically picking up clumps of sphagnum cuspidatum, the aquatic one, and throwing it into water where it's not already there. It's great. It's very scientific. Uh, yeah, trees and doing all these things. So we do a variety of surveys over the year as well, which are obviously quite seasonal. So it's bogbush crickets and dragonflies and all kinds of things that are listed there in really tiny writing, unless you've got a giant screen. Uh, but what you can also get out of it is training. So there's things called AQAs, which are from the exam board AQA, they do um, accredited units scheme. So it's very small things which technically aren't a qualification, they're a record mission of achievement you get a certificate at the end so you can do that if you want to learn a bit more in depth about for example peatland conservation there's also um, invasive species control and a whole variety of different things and then it once you've uh, volunteered with us a while and done everything else <laughs> there's occasionally chances to get some certificates like first aid, outdoor first aid or brush cutter, that type of stuff we normally do with uh, the carbon landscape. So sign up to their volunteer list as well as ours. And yet yeah, while you're out, obviously it's just a nice opportunity to meet different people. We've got people like teenagers just starting uni. We've got retired guys in their seventies, everyone in between, all kinds of different backgrounds, different experiences. It's you don't have to be an expert in anything at all. It's how I started. So, as well as volunteering out on the moss, you could become a friend. So we've got a active friends of group for the Chat Moss Reserve. So that's Little Alden, Cadishead, and Astley. Uh, we might one day set up a friends group for another Mossland site. So get in contact if it's ever anything you're interested in. <clears throat> There's a variety of roles that it says there, chair, vice chair, treasurer, a few different kinds of secretary, events coordinator, pretty much anything you can think of. You can give yourself a title if you want to join the committee and help out. They'll be more than happy with that. Uh, you can get the chance to help deliver public events. So it might be at a stall at a community fair, it could be an activity day out on the moss, a planting day out on the moss different things and you can get if you're looking at getting a career in conservation it's a good way to get experience in the more admin side of things looking at funding and uh, networking with other organizations so if you're interested in, in the friends of chat moss you can go to friendschatmoss.org you can also find them on facebook so, uh, next one yeah so the days Obviously, this is in less COVID-y times. At the moment, we're running slightly less days with a few less people on them. But generally, <clears throat> there'll be a chance to come out on Little Walden once or twice a week and Astley Weekly. And we are looking at having the occasional day at Red Moss, which is up near Bolton's football stadium. And obviously, and also with Marley Moss, which we mentioned earlier, up near Garstang, Preston kind of way. So what else, apart from volunteering, can you do? You can go pee free. So these are photos you have seen earlier, Little Walden, after being extracted, and what we've managed to get it to after almost 10 years of hard work, it would have been much nicer if it just stayed like that in the first place. Let's not make these brown desolate wastelands so yeah p3
is the way to go, which we'll talk a bit more on the next slide. How can you go P3? So the main thing that P has been extracted for is the compost. So P3 compost, it, last year it was sold at everywhere from Audi to Waitrose. So it's on both ends of the spectrum. It is out there. Sometimes it can take a bit of looking around to find but most places now do stock it. It's not just not, not always very obvious. So yeah, the compost going into your bag, it's taken thousands of years to form and only a couple of years to take away. Harder than P3 compost is finding plants that are potted in P3 medium. So you just have to ask basically. It, is a lot harder, but the more people ask for them, the more they're going to get stocked. And hopefully the government will decide that they just need to be peat free anyway. And if you really can't find peat free compost, you can also just make your own if you've got space in the garden. You don't need a massive compost pile. You can get a huge range of different size compost bins. You can even get ones about that size that make it super quickly. So any bit of space, you can make your own. And yeah, in a campaign for garden centres and shops to go free, bug them all the time, nag them every time you're in there. Even if you know somewhere stocks peak free, just ask anyway, because then they're always going to be getting asked if they have peak free. So it's always on the front of their minds. Uh, if as well as obviously supermarkets and the big uh, DIY stores the little local garden centers tend to be better for finding p3 in this area at least we've found the like big name in p3 compost is Dale for they do a, a range for like uh, cactus and bulbs and seeding as well as just normal multi-purpose can be a bit pricey, but we found if you happen to live near Chat Moss, Princess Park Garden Centre in Erdem does stock them. So there's definitely one place nearby that has P3 compost. Let us know where else you can find it. Um, and as well as uh, compost and potted plants, one thing that people don't realise is turf. If you're redoing your garden, you've got rolls of grass, that little centimetre or two on the bottom is generally grown on peat. So that's 10 or 20 years worth of peat that you're putting down with your grass. And you can imagine that over time, every time they're cutting that up, it's slowly getting less and less peat and it's gonna be harder for us to restore one day. I think that is about everything you can do to help peat. <laughs> Thank you very much. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the talk so far. And yeah, we'll go back to Hilary and Eddie. Thank you, Jamie. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Thank you. Absolutely brilliant and um, inspiring to uh, to hear all the work that's been going on uh, on the restoration of the bogs and the peatlands. Just uh, incredible. Thanks very much. Now, while you've been talking, we have had. Um, some questions in and I think I'd like to start Zaza's asked a question about volunteering because I know Jamie you were just talking about volunteering and that it was um, reduced during this lockdown but she specifically asked you know is it happening and I guess people will also want to know how they could how they could get involved and how do they find out yeah it is still happening volunteering is one of the permitted activities under all the different tiers and lockdown so we are going ahead just being a bit more cautious with it uh, if you email volunteering at lanxwt.org.uk or if you have a look on the website there is a page i think is support us volunteering and then you can register as a volunteer and you'll get sent all the details there great great absolutely brilliant thank you i hope that's answered your question um, because I know uh, you've explained how vital volunteers are to the work you're doing and certainly all those 
tens of thousands of tiny plants uh, need to be planted by a lot of people, don't they? Yeah, um, we didn't have a lot of people last summer and it, it, it was, yeah, we, we prefer planting tens of thousands with lots of people instead of just me and the yes. other guy. Of course. Yeah, of course. yeah, I can imagine, I can imagine. Um, um, oh, sorry, sorry yeah. Ellie, go ahead. Um, this has come into our, our questions box. Someone says, are there any instances where tree planting on peat soils is acceptable or should all peat soils be restored where possible? So possibly a difficult question, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try and answer that. Um, and maybe Andy and Jamie, you can chip in. I would say <clears throat> in general, um, trees, um, it, it's all about trees, uh, the right tree, in the right place when it comes to thinking about where trees are best suited and where they should be planted and in general um, peat uh, trees on peat is not the place because trees will as some of the issues that Andy's raised already that for example drying out the peat creating cracks you know for um, causing water drainage etc so um, in general I would say the general rule is think about what what tree species is and where it's most appropriate to plant and in general we don't encourage planting of trees on peat soils however as Andy mentioned you know there are instances where you can get areas of sort of um, wet woodland for example around the edges of, of peatlands um, and there is a in some species are appropriate but Andy do you want to chip in a bit more on that as well? Yeah it's just kind of like uh, two questions in one the first instance is uh, are Tree plants on tree planting on peat soils is acceptable, but it's the second part of the question that kind of answers that in a sense. And really, any peat, personally, in my opinion, any peat soils that are restorable to a lowland bog should not be planted with trees, they should be restored to a lowland bog. Um, like Sarah says, there are instances where trees will occur, like I alluded to before, they will occur uh, within peaty soils naturally. And there's a difference between actively planting trees on something that's restorable to a much rarer habitat, a lowland bog in this instance something that occurs there naturally and there's a balance to find in a sense in that way again the size of says trees in the right place um but if, if you were going to apply a hierarchy to it and say if you could have one or the other if you want to play that kind of game yeah, play devil's advocate i'd say no you, you don't plant trees on peat soil you restore them to bog where possible yeah and i guess there's, there's lots of other habitats where you can plant trees aren't there there's lots yeah. uh, lots of less valuable habitats and certainly uh, here in Manchester we're very keen to promote uh, street trees, tree planting along the pavements of course for oh, lots yeah. of reasons. Um, so yes lots of other places to plant trees yeah. in the area isn't there? Definitely. Yeah. So we've got a, sorry we've got a question from Sarah who when you were talking about Little Walden Moss she um, asked whether it's open to visitors at the moment. Now I know we've got uh, restrictions on people have to stay locally don't they at the moment but are uh, is little walden moss open to visitors yeah, yeah. little walden is 24 7 in it jamie yeah so it's got a public path around the edge the gates when they're not stolen are always open <laughs> so yeah you're free to go ahead and visit just be aware there's no facilities there's no uh, toilets or much shelter around that you can go and have a walk great we recently installed a new yeah. path actually yeah, just on that note, yeah, a new path has been installed and also there's going to be a new seating area as well, kind of centrally as well, to replace the old bird hide coming um, shortly, hopefully. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, so, 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 yeah, but hopefully a good resource for people who need to get out. You know, it's really good for our mental health at the moment, especially to get out in nature, outdoors if we can, especially during you know, the current restrictions. So if you live locally, please go out and, and just enjoy the amazing work that the, my team have been doing and the, the nature that's there, you know, all year round so it's really like it's good for, good for your mind to get out of the bog. Yeah. It's surprisingly peaceful considering it's about eight miles away from Manchester Piccadilly. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah which is also surprisingly peaceful at the moment. <laughs> <I can imagine. laughs> yeah. So, so uh, Jenny asks how can farmers make money from carbon farming? Now this is a really good question. So one of the things we're exploring as part of the, the Care Peat Carbon Farm pilot is looking at ways, because obviously uh, it's, it's not um, realistic to expect farmers, to, you know, they need to make a living and we, we, we're not asking about um, people to stop um, 
um, you know, managing the land for their farm businesses. So we're trying to look at ways that can both benefit the climate and wildlife and still provide um, incomes for um, uh, farm businesses. So we're exploring uh, the mechanisms as to, way, as to how carbon farming could provide an income. And one of the things is that we know that with the new um, uh, agri-environment payments, the new elms that are coming to, um, going to come into force now post Brexit, we've got new new farm subsidies schemes being developed and they're going to be very much geared towards payment for what you call payment for public goods. So for example, there could be um, payment schemes for those who manage the land in a way that reduces carbon emissions and carbon farming would be one, one way. Um, the, other, the other one is, it, it, I can imagine it would be a mixture of sort of public and private finance. There's quite the increasing um, demand from um, companies, uh, for example, who are needing to balance their carbon emissions, and there might be ways that they will be able to support uh, land management this way through um, financial support that yeah, will bring a farm um, income as well. But what, interestingly, we're looking at uh, carbon farming. We see this as an intermediary between sort of um, uh, pure conservation, like what we do in our, rest, our nature reserves, and some more intensive agriculture. It could be sort of, you know, one part of the way a landscape is managed. And there could be other, there's other wetter farming trials elsewhere in the UK and um, in Europe as well, where people are trying other crops, where obviously what we do at the carbon farm is we've planted a permanent cover crop of sphagnum, so that's not going to be harvested. But there, for example, um, you could harvest sphagnum to be used as alternative growing media, which would still protect the peat soils and you'd have a crop to sell. So there could be other ways that, you know, you can, um, manage peat soils in a more wetter way and still produce a crop to sell and I think that all that is coming I can see that there'll be increasing demand for that going forward. Yeah yeah well that sounds sensible doesn't it. Um, Diane's asked uh, that she's thinking about gardening there's a few people have been chatting and, and asking about gardening with peat free compost and she's saying that you know she can see that there are lots of groups over the country all working to protect peat and would it be beneficial to form an alliance to magnify the impact of peat-free campaigns? Absolutely, um, yeah, absolutely, it's a really good point. I think, I, mean, I know for example that um, uh, we already have a sort of like soft social media campaign for peat-free at the moment, um, but the wildlife trusts nationally are going to be, I think there are plans for a nationwide peat-free campaign, but also I know that there has been formerly alliances of multiple organisations getting together. And I agree, like, you know, the, the louder the voice, the more like it's going to be heard. And the government have, have talked about the voluntary peat ban, it hasn't worked. So I think it's going to have to be a mixture of up you know, top down from, you know, policy. And also the more consumers ask for it, you know, the more people say, where is it? Why isn't it here? The more likely the, the business is going to listen. And the, so I think it's a joint effort from the consumers and also policy makers. And also you're right, all classes get together, you know, loud the voice. Yeah. yeah. So Brilliant. anyone who wants to campaign, please let me know. <laughs> great, great. I'm sure lots of people will. There's, a, there's an awful lot of interest. I know there's um, lots of people are really committed gardeners and nobody wants to be destroying one habitat in order to create another, do they? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's really difficult because gardening, you know, it's amazing activity. Um, and it's really sad if you just you destroy one habitat to create another. So let's try and find a way where we can still keep gardening and also protect our peatlands. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. So I think that's probably, I know we've got, we've got a lot of questions, don't we, Hilary? Do you we have, do. Did you have another somebody. one? Somebody's again on peat free uh, compost. Somebody's asked, uh, Alison's asked, is there a designation we can look out for? Um, you know, like the equivalent of the Soil Association certification for organic? Or, there's, there's, I, I know yeah. some, some compost say, some bags of compost say that they're reduced peat, don't they? Mm -hmm. and, and less peat. And yeah. I don't think there's one label that's universally used. I think often on, like, uh, for example, if you go to, the B&Q, their own version of um, their compost they sell, they often have like a hierarchy, a colour chart which shows the percentage of peat in it. I think what I would say, one thing to be careful of is there's, there are some people selling what's called responsibly or sustainably sourced peat. There is no such thing. No. So beware of that label. It's, full, it's a false promise. Um, so uh, I think looking for, looking 
check the labels. If it doesn't say peat free, just check on the back, look at the percentage of peat. They should all say at least how much peat they content they have in their compost. Yeah, great, great, great. I think we might have to wrap questions up there. Can you answer some um, typing oh. wise if you like? What was that? Sorry, Andy. You can type a few answers to these guys if you want. That, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, because that would um, be great. It is definitely um, it's an ongoing discussion and um, you know we're we're all about still and around yes. and and here um, this isn't your one and only chance to to have your questions about peatlands or about going peat free um, answered do you absolutely feel free to to get in touch with us yeah. um, and I suppose now is the kind of great time to to say that um, there is a Facebook page Lancashire peatlands initiative um, so do you give do you give uh, that a follow so you'll be uh, kept up to date with everything going on with um, the peatlands via that page. So do make sure to do that. Um, I'm also going to mention as well that um, while we're talking about actions that people can take, the uh, person called Diane has very kindly dropped into the chat a petition called Ban mm. Use of Peat in Horticulture and All Growing Material uh, by 2023. So if you can find that now and click it, fantastic, or, or just um, look it up later, uh, let's, let's all be signing that and, and sharing that. So thank you very much for flagging that, Diane. And keep yeah. an eye out for the Peat Free campaign um, and share that and, and ask if you can't find Peat Free um, compost, um, at your garden centre or at, at the shops, then ask, ask where it is. Don't be afraid to, to get a bit noisy about it because it is so, so important. Absolutely. Um, um, yeah, we're happy to, yeah, if people don't have any other questions we can't have to say, then please get in touch via our Facebook page and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try to get back to you and answer your questions. Great, so I will just kind of finish and just wrap things up in that case. So um, just to say, you know, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you so much for uh, getting involved in the chat, for asking all, all those questions. Um, sorry we couldn't get around to everyone. Um, we had over 100, 100 people on, on the call, so you can imagine <laughs> that we've had a lot of questions all coming in, but it's all great. Um, do keep that conversation that conversation going. Um, I know a lot of people joining the call today are uh, already members with the Wildlife Trust so I'd just like to say thank you so much for your support. It makes work like this um, and projects like this possible. We couldn't do it without your support. If you have been thinking about joining us as a member, um, now is a great chance to do it as we have a half price sale on at the moment so you can join us for half price um, which is as little as one pound fifty uh, a month so do check that out um, it's a great deal and i will also just flag up our next event so next week we are uh, doing a talk with Rianne Fatanikan who is the founder and chair of Black Girls Hike and who recently featured on Country Files. So very, very exciting. It's free, it's at the same time next Wednesday. Um, so do make sure to sign up to that if you're interested. And um, other than that, I, I'd just like to say, yeah, thank you again. And thank you to, to Sarah, Andy and Jamie for joining us. And thank you to everyone for joining and showing interest in the work we're doing. And I really hope that we'll be able to be in touch with people going forward. Thank Great. you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Stay safe. Bye. 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 Bye.